Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to the Minnesota Zoo in the Our World Speaker Series. We're happy to have you join us tonight. My name is Seth Stapleton and I am the Director of Conservation here at the Minnesota Zoo. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment, which provides funding to make this event free for all of us. So to allow wider access for the presentation, we offer live captioning, and there's an emphasis on live. Our captioner is typing as I speak, having no idea what I'm going to say next, so we ask in advance for your understanding when words may be incorrect. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce somebody who probably doesn't need any introduction, but that's my job anyways, so uh, Dr. Jeff Montefiore. So Jeff was born and raised in Sarks Hill, Minnesota, and has made Northwest Namibia his home since 2003, when he was introduced to Save the Rhino Trust, or SRT, after completing his master's degree at the University of Cape Town. For more than a decade, Jeff has served as SRT's science advisor, and continues to hold this post under his employment with the Minnesota Zoo. Jeff brings scientific leadership to SRT by managing and analyzing their long-term rhino monitoring data, um, and conducting applied research on rhino ecology, behavior, and tourism. He also co-founded the Rhino uh, Ranger Incentive Program in 2011. We'll be hearing a little bit more about that tonight, actually a lot more about that tonight, and currently advises the development of a community-based monitoring program in Northwest China to support the conservation of the endangered Asian wild horse. So Jeff has also conducted field work in Alaska, Canada, Minnesota, Ecuador, Honduras, South Africa, and China, and that has largely been targeting large carnivore conservation. Jeff completed his PhD on tourism as a rhino conservation tool based on more than a decade of novel applied research. He lives and works primarily at a remote field camp known as World's End in Namibia with his wife, Pasilia, and their two children, Kano and Tema. So let's give a world warm welcome to Dr. Jeff Montefiore. Um, can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Seth, and thank you guys all for coming tonight, uh, braving the rain. I, I feel like every time I come back home, either I'm in a polar vortex, uh, April, or a, a April snowstorm, or a, another big downpour with rain. And if I can ask one thing, everybody just think for two seconds. Rain, go to Namibia. Rain, go to Namibia. Rain, go to Namibia. <laughs> We're waiting for rain now this year, it's been a bit dry. But again, thank you guys all for coming tonight. Um, it's always great for me to come back, um, back to Minnesota, back to my roots, uh, not only to be back in Minnesota, but to share uh, a lot of our work in Namibia, which oftentimes for me definitely feels a world away. But I can tell you it's, it's really with great pride that I'm able to wear the, the Minnesota Zoo logo out in the desert. Uh, many, many times I end up seeing fellow Americans who are absolutely shocked that the Minnesota Zoo is bouncing around in the, in the rocks out in the desert in Namibia. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me. And tonight um, I'm going to be talking specifically about um, a lot of our work on developing partnerships and specifically uh, pride with local communities and how that relates to our rhino conservation program. And most of the time when I start my, um, my presentations, I like to get the bad news out of the way first. Always when we talk about conservation, there's a bit of bad mixed with the good. Um, and as, as many of you probably are aware, um, rhinos are being poached. They're being poached at um, incredible rates. Um, over the past five or six years, Africa has lost three rhinos a day on average. Um, the population probably will not be able to sustain that, that level of poaching. Uh, primarily, the poaching is in South Africa, uh, but over the past few years it has trickled into Namibia. But what I want to share with you guys tonight is what I believe to be a really hopeful um, situation that, again, through the support of the Minnesota Zoo and our efforts there, we've really, I think, um, done a, a, a good job on trying to turn the tide on poaching. So. I'm going to start with a little story. Uh, my time in Namibia uh, back in 2003 with, um, with our local partner Save the Rhino Trust, which I'll mention in a second, started at this meeting. Um, this was my first community meeting, and literally under a tree. And I know you can't see the background very well there, but there is nothing for hundreds of miles. Um, and it was a shocker to me just to see people coming out of out of the mountains, out of the, out of the hills, on foot, on donkey, donkey cart. Um, and they were all coming to talk about one thing. They were coming to talk about rhinos. And I thought that was 
that was pretty cool. Um, but now I showed up and I was straight out of graduate school. You know, I've got my maps and my models and my numbers and I'm ready to educate all these people about what rhinos need to survive. And I got my turn and I stood up and I just wada 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 and I think the only thing I managed to do that night was put a few of the elders to sleep. <laughs> um, I got a few funny smiles and I suspect that was just because they had no idea what I was talking about. And they were being very polite. But what I learned from that, that meeting, I learned a lot of things from that meeting, but one of the most critical things I learned was that in this, in this game of rhino conservation specifically, Science is not the answer to the, to, to, to the problem. And we needed to think much more deeper, much more um, out of the box in terms of the strategies that we were going to use. And thankfully, I was working under the wing of an organization that had already been around for over 30 years in that region, doing groundbreaking work on this very kind of thinking. And at that time, it was completely unconventional. You know, the conservation approach was very, very top-down, government-led, put up a park, kick all the locals out. Um, you know, you know the, all the wildlife was really just for the, the elite people to benefit from, um, and local people were not involved at all. But Save the Rhino Trust, um, back in the early 80s, started by um, this woman here named Blythe Lutie, the lace Blythe Lutie, was really one of the first organizations that actually started engaging local people, seeing local people actually as part of the solution and not the problem. And in fact, what they did when the first wave of rhino poaching came back in the early 80s was they were actually looking to hire some of the hunters and the poachers to come and work for them. That might seem surprising, but it's very common today. And the reason is actually simple. One, most people that, that poach or that hunt do it not because they want to kill rhinos or because they want to make a bunch of money, but because they just want to support their family. And if they can support their family with a good, solid job, they would definitely opt for that. The other reason, the obvious reason, is that the hunters are the ones that know the wildlife. They have to. That's, that's their, their livelihood, is hunting. So to bring them in is really, really critical. And local people have an unbelievable attachment to the local land, especially out in these rural areas, because they have to rely on it to survive. So Save the Rhino Trust developed this really simple but effective system of just hiring local people who know the land, who know the rhinos, to go out and keep track of them, make sure they're healthy, make sure they're safe, and to have them out collecting information on the whereabouts of the rhinos. And after this um, program started in the late 80s, it sort of went through different transitions. And after I arrived, and after that meeting um, under the tree, a lot of the work was actually moving towards how can we further engage local people in seeing tangible benefits from rhinos. We had to make rhinos relevant to the local people. And one of the ways to do that is through tourism. Not a novel idea by any means, but making tourism actually connect to conservation and produce real conservation outcomes is not always easy and it's not always clear cut. So a lot of my work in those early years between 2003 and 2008 was developing some really new novel ways of integrating the great work that Save the Rhino was doing with monitoring teams with a tourism opportunity where guests could go out on foot with our teams, see the rhinos, and a lot of that funding that, or the, the, the income that was generated from the tourism would go back to support um, the local tracking teams, um, which was very exciting. And what that did was it created this excitement among the local people that, hey, these rhinos are actually worth something. They're worth something alive. We better look out for it. And um, within a few years, we started get, getting lots of requests to move rhinos into new places. And between 2005 and 2010, we moved almost 40 rhinos with the government support into new, co into new community areas where they had, had been poached out in the past. And this, is, this was not happening anywhere in Africa. This was one of the few places where local people were actually requesting rhinos to come back on their land. And a lot of this was driven by the desire and the hope um, to do some tourism with it. But while this was all happening, Obviously, you can see there are some issues that we need to think about. Moving rhinos into new places, they need protection, they need monitoring, and of course we had to set up the tourism. So coming up with an expansion strategy that would able to look after and, and take care of these rhinos was absolutely critical. 
And with the rhinos, um, again, like I mentioned before, um, they need all the help that they can get. Um, this is a map that shows the historical distribution here in yellow. The red is the current distribution. Um, and in just my lifetime, it's sad to say that 97% of the black rhinos in the world, there's two species in Africa, white and black, 97% of the black rhinos have been wiped out, have been hunted. This number is a little bit higher now, we're up to about 5,500, but in about 2008, you can see the poaching trends across Africa completely skyrocketed. These blue bars are South Africa, so again, like I mentioned, you can see that the vast majority of rhinos being poached in South Africa, or are in South Africa, but since 2013, over a thousand rhinos a year were being poached. Something scary, something that we had to consider. And even in Namibia, for us, it wasn't a matter of if this was going to happen, it was a matter of when. And we were also observing some, some very uh, disturbing trends you know, in our area, we knew as Save the Rhino Trust, kind of the sole organization doing monitoring, that we did not have the, the capacity to look after all these rhinos. Our budgets were pretty stagnant. We were trying our best to raise money, but, you know, it wasn't going very far. And, um, you know, we could, we could also see that a lot of the communities had not necessarily come up and <coughs> hired enough people to also look after, after the rhinos that were now on their land. So this was a big concern for us. So at the same time, this kind of information is what you were seeing and reading in the newspapers. You know, everything you were basically seeing had something to do with war, something to do with blood, something to do with um, killing fields. And when you have this kind of media blitz, as we probably also know today's media, you start to get a perception, and a perception of the problem. And the convention that has to do with rhino poaching, even back in the 80s, but also now, is built on this idea of war, that it's a war out there. And when you have that kind of a, of a definition of, of the problem, it's no surprise that you see poaching as a problem, right? The rhinos are dying, they're being poached, that must be the problem. And if that's your problem definition, the solution, is to catch those poachers. And often what happens is, you have the response being all these military teams out there with their guns and their drones and their killer dogs and everything, and they're literally hunting poachers. They're hunting these guys that are sent in to do the dirty work for other people much higher up the poaching chain. And these are the guys that end up getting caught. And it, it's reinforced by what we call this fortress conservation approach. Putting up guns, putting up fences, chucking all the local people out, creating this huge massive social injustice and this big divide between the local people and the conservationists. So another way to think about it, and which what I think is really our unique difference uh, in Namibia, is the way that we fundamentally look at the problem and the way that we use that perspective to drive our strategies. So we kind of see it as a two-step process. So first, we have to have law enforcement. Nobody would ever say, <laughs> yeah, the act of poaching is a criminal act. We need law enforcement. But law enforcement really is the tip of that iceberg. And if you look down, or if you don't look down, you're missing a big, big part of, of the whole context, the whole issue. And in Namibia, we believe that poaching is actually the consequence of a much bigger problem. And that that bigger problem has to do with this, disenchant this disenfranchisement of the local people. And if we can turn that into a, a solution that works to engage and empower local people in protecting rhino, it's going to go a long way in supporting law enforcement. So working with local people is, has been, and probably will always be the core of everything that we do in Namibia. So our second step was, then, we took this a step further. We said that Save the Rhino Trust has been around for 35 years. We want to actually shift the whole rhino protection paradigm away from an NGO or a conservation group activity to a real community-led approach. And again, we felt like doing that would be taking a big step again towards that, that better problem definition of getting communities more involved. So in 2011, we were, we were literally requested by the communities to help train their people, motivate them, get them out doing work. And then in 2012, we formed what's known as the Rhino Ranger Incentive Program. 
which actually is, is made up of two different parts. Um, both organizations that support the communities as well as the communities themselves and their rangers. So the way that it's structured is pretty simple. At the top, which is always critical, especially in rhino conservation, the government has to have oversight over the program. In Namibia, all of our rhinos are owned by the government. They are <coughs> state property. Um, so it's very important to keep them engaged. Um, but underneath there, they have these communities that have rhino on their land. So within this program, we divide it into two, into two sections. The support group, which is the conservation organizations that have a bunch of skills and expertise in looking after rhino. Save the Rhino Trust um, and a couple other local organizations that have been working with communities for years. And this program actually helped bring us all together under one banner, under one common goal of helping to support these what we call conservancy rhino rangers. And, and these are guys from the local communities that are appointed by and employed by their own community leadership. So they're given jobs and they have responsibilities to report to their own people, supported by us. And the feedback then from them, from those local communities, goes straight back also to the government um, as part of their agreements. So when we sat down and we started thinking through this problem, we developed something what we call a theory of change. But it basically is a really great tool that allows you, that, that forces you actually, to think through your whole strategy. Think through your approach about how you want to do something. And you can think of it as a, as a way of dividing sort of the design of the program as well as the outcomes. So what I want to talk about quick here is, is the design aspects. So what we really wanted to do again, that engagement and empowerment was so critical. And we were going to do that, if we could do that, we were going to create tools, skills, knowledge, and motivation um, that improve the overall well-being of the local people. And if we did that, and if it's coordinated and planned through these local institutions, and if we could attach that to these income-generating opportunities, we would make a, a, bi a big difference. So the way we structured the program then had sort of three components. We have rhino monitoring. We have, the guys have to know how to find the rhinos, where they are, how they're doing. Once they do that, we transition them into tourism. So again, we've been doing this for a number of years. So now we want to move them into being able to actually lead and guide their own um, tourism activities. And then lastly, the Rhino Pride, which I'll touch about on the end. So the first part has to do with the incentives that we were going to provide to these guys. And these are really, really critical. If they don't have these things, these incentives, it's really difficult for them to do their work. So things like reliable transport, equipment, um, instead, of, uh, instead of equipping them with, with guns and drones, we give them cameras and GPSs, things that help build relationships with their rhinos so that they understand more about them. We give them lots of training based on, um, based on a lot of our expertise and knowledge. We give them uniforms. You can see here um, these unique logos on hats, sort of nice branding. The guys get pretty excited about that. And then we also give what's critical, these performance-based bonuses. So every time they see a rhino, and they complete good information, take good photos, they get a little bit of extra money. And that little bit of extra money, it's like three or four dollars for us, but it makes a big difference for them. And it really motivates these guys to do great work. And then something that's a little bit slightly newer is we've created these non-monetary benefits, things like awards and recognition to sort of complement a lot of those, those, those money rewards. Um, just to, again, add that extra motivation um, to their work. So when it comes to building relationships with rhinos, it's really critical that the guys just get to learn these rhinos on their land. They get to name them. Um, they get to learn the different ear notches um, and horn shapes. So we know all of our rhinos in our area by name based on these features. So we help uh, create these little tools. These are little pocket cards that the guys go out with, with uh, each rhino's name on it, when it was born, male or female, where it's from. And they use these cards to actually learn about the rhinos. These are rhinos in their area, and they need to learn about them. So we also get them reporting all their information straight back to their community leadership. And we do this just with some simple tools where the guys list out all the rhinos in their area, and they just tick each month. Did we see it? Did we not see it? It sounds really simple, right? But it's really, really important, and it draws people in. It gets people excited, gets people interested. And remember, most places, Local people are not involved in this stuff at all. They are left out, it's up to the government or the conservation groups. So for local people, 
to be doing this themselves is a big change in the way in the way things work. For the rangers, we also have created diaries. So this is a great way for for each individual ranger to keep track of their expertise, their experience. So they get to check all the different things that they did on the, on, on each rhino sighting. You know, did they track it? Did they did they record the information? Did they take the photograph? And this becomes almost like a mini resume for them. They can take that around. They can use it. Um, they can keep it for when they, if they want to move on to a different job. It's a nice little tool. And once they get provisioned at a lot of this stuff, that's when we move over into the tourism. And the tourism is a really, really critical aspect of this work um, for two main reasons. The first one is the tourism, through the partnership agreements that we're able to establish, provides significant income back to the community um, that they can put back into conservation. And I'll show you some results in a, in a few minutes. But what it also does, and which was surprising to me, I didn't expect, is that when the tourists engage with our rangers after they see a rhino, and they almost always see a rhino, they're so impressed with the work that the guys are doing that this positive feedback also really, really motivates the guys to do even better work. And because my job is to go through and see all of the information at the end of every month, I can tell you that the information that we get from the guys doing tourism is much, much better than the other teams because they know that they have to show that stuff to the guests and they're going to get asked about it. So they don't leave anything missing. They make sure everything is very clear. Uh, but it's really a great motivation and it's great to see them smile. You know, when somebody says, wow, that's incredible. You've, you've seen that rhino how many times? It's really, it's really something to see. So a lot of different benefits from the tourism. And then the last thing around the design I wanted to mention has to do with our farm visits. So this is something newer that we've done. Um, oftentimes when we go out on patrols, we end up speeding past a lot of local farms and just basically, well, literally leaving them in the dust. And when we went to go speak with some of these farmers, when we knew there was some poaching pressure in the area, nobody was too interested in talking to us. They said, yeah, you guys just fly by, you do your own thing, and that's fine, whatever. So we said, okay, wait a minute. Why don't we start stopping and actually having tea, having coffee with these guys, sit down and actually have a conversation. So for the past year or so, we started doing this. We'd take a day or two days out of every patrol where the guys would literally just come to the farmers, bring some sugar, bring some tea, sit down and have a conversation. And it's been really, really incredible. We, we've got some of our rangers now that say they actually have to turn their phones off because the farmers are calling them constantly, telling them <laughs> stories about rhinos. And, oh, this one was coming and drinking last night. And it's all about building relationships, building trust, but seeing rhinos in a, in, in a positive light. So now we're, we've done all this stuff. Have we been successful? The big question, you know, does, it, does it actually mean anything? So when we look at that second half of that results chain, you know, if we do all these other things, then these are the things that we hope to achieve. So, you know, are we protecting and, and our communities investing in their protection? Are we improving the quality and quantity of rhino monitoring? And does the community start to see these guys um, and, and really show a lot more respect for the ranger's work? And of course, ultimately, will the po poaching be less tolerated and will we see positive rhino growth? Uh, growth? So, these were the things that we can now test with some actual data. And because I am a bit of a scientist sometimes, um, I do have to show a few graphs, which I hope you will find somewhat enjoyable. So this is, this is just a simple chart that shows patrol effort as number of days out over the past you know, seven or eight years. This is here um, when we started the Ranger program. And you can see at the bottom here, um, these are rhino, rhino uh, sightings and these are patrol days. You can see how things sort of slowly started going up, 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 and then boom, all of a sudden we saw this huge increase in the patrol effort in about 2015 and, and rhino sightings. And you also see a nice little trend here of the poaching. All the way down from what was almost 20 in one year all the way down to absolutely nothing last year. We have not lost a rhino in 20 months. Work. Yeah, we're, we're very happy with that result, for sure. And another really interesting chart that we can look at, this is also showing patrol effort, but we've got the divide between Save the Rhino Trust, which was, again, the old status quo, with now our ranger teams. So they represent the green bars, and you can see how that's grown over time, 
to last year, we've had almost 60% now of all the patrol effort being produced by the, by the communities themselves. And again, that follows this pattern of, of poaching reduction um, very nicely. When we look at the number of communities that are, or community rangers that are on rhino sightings, again, a massive growth. Back in 2014, we only had 16% of rhino sightings had community rangers on. Now, almost 80% of all the rhino sightings have conservancy rangers on it. They are becoming much more engaged. If we look at the collaboration, this has also been absolutely key to us, how we work together with other partners. You can see at the beginning of the program here, it was really just Save the Rhino Trust working with the rangers. But over time, we started adding more partners. And then here, if you remember that, that, um, that, that, that picture with the three aspects, monitoring, and when we moved into tourism, and we started expanding the tourism here in 2016, we pulled in an additional four tourism partners who were assisting the, the rangers with their patrols. And you can see we jumped from two, from one, two, three, all the way up to eight different partners. And that has made a huge difference in the patrol effort here. Again, nice relationships, of course, with the poaching. And of course, with the coverage, too. Um, it doesn't help if you're just patrolling a lot more and more and more in the same area. We need to expand this. This area in red is the range of the rhino. Um, this is a huge area. This is almost half of northern Minnesota. Basically, the, the boundary waters times about three. We had, in the past, we had four teams of guys trying to cover this huge area. It was just ridiculous. Look at it now. It's covered with a number of different teams and a number of different institutions that are working out there. And we, when we have had poachers come into the area, they have literally said that every time and every place that they went, they just gave up because there were teams out on the ground everywhere, and they ended up going somewhere else to poach. Which doesn't solve the problem, of course, but at least, at least they're not poaching our rhinos. <laughs> With the tourism results, we see also some really exciting things happening here. So over time, this blue bar represents the amount of income that's being generated from the tourism. And last year, we generated over a quarter of a million U.S. dollars that went straight from the tourism operators back into community pockets. But what's even more interesting with this result that I like is this, these yellow bars. And these yellow bars represent the number of community employed rangers that are going out every month. We've gone from about 18 all the way up to 65. So the, the communities are not only receiving money from tourism, but they're putting it right back into rhino protection. They are indeed investing in this resource now that they see value in it. And the last little graph I wanted to show today is uh, just demonstrates again the expansion of the number of rangers that are busy now and capable of leading tourism. We've grown from virtually nothing at the beginning to the little three all the way up to almost half of the rangers now. Almost 30 rangers are able to lead tourism and they've become these huge assets for their community because they can provide this service that's generating a lot of money. These guys are our heroes. And I just love telling this, short, this story quick about one of our rangers, because we have a lot of interesting guys that come and join the program. And this, this guy is uh, sort of my right-hand man. His name's Boas Hembo. Um, he's been doing conservation work in the area for about 20 years. And he's training now one of our, our new rangers named Chips. This is now back in about 2012. Um, so he's showing him how to use a camera, how to use a GPS, kind of not with rhinos around, uh, but just out in the field. His first, second, third, fourth rhino sighting, he refused to approach the rhino. He thought, this is crazy. Who, who would go this close to rhinos? And he actually, Boas had to go find the guys hiding down in this ravine about <laughs> two or three hundred yards away while they watched Boas do all this work. But by the end of that patrol, by the end of that 20 days that they were out, he was taking pictures like this. Don't ever let anybody tell you guys can't figure out how to use a camera. This picture, he took a few months later, and often when I put this up there, people are asking me, what National Geographic photographer took that? <laughs> I said, his name's Chips. He's a Himba guy with no education. <laughs> and more recently, this is our latest calf from about two months ago. Should be about three months now. Um, same guy, he's been around now six, six years. Same guy that was so afraid to even approach a rhino taking pictures like this. Very, very exciting. 
So I want to shift now into what I consider to be one of our more exciting um, transitions of the program, which is what we call our Rhino Pride campaign, which consists of taking what we've learned, taking this sort of motivation and passion for protecting rhinos to the broader community, going much deeper, much beyond just getting rangers out into the field, which is also really critical to our community approach. And what we did was we brought together again a number of community members, a number of um, organizations that have been working in the area, and we put together a plan. There were some fellow partners, uh, fellow colleagues from the Minnesota Zoo that came over from Houston Zoo, and we all sat down and we had some baseline information on the attitudes and beliefs around reporting rhino crime, especially from the farmers, and we used this information um, to help us design this pride program. So we had some guys going out, they interviewed about three or four hundred farmers, talking to them about, you know, what do you find difficult about reporting? Are there things that would keep you from reporting? Are there things that might get you a little bit more interested in rhino? You know, and how do you feel about rhino? And again, this information was really, really critical because it wasn't us just, you know, again, sitting in an office designing some program. We were actually going out, listening to the people, and designing a program based on what they were interested in. And what came across really clear was that the youth wanted to be engaged. They were really, really interested. And again, if you remember what I said at the beginning, one of our biggest concerns was that there was a lot of unemployed youth moving back to the villages. They had gone out to town, didn't make it, coming back. They're looking for something to do. This is a great way also of keeping them out of the bars, out of drugs, and hopefully away from the poachers. So we've created a number of youth groups, um, and the youth groups were engaged often by the rangers themselves. So again, it was this great way of, of getting the rangers, telling them about their work, making them feel proud, getting that positive feedback from the youth, um, and getting them more, again, engaged in what these guys are doing. What's been more interesting is that the youth clubs have really taken on almost a life of their own, and they've started now making their own initiatives, doing their own things, coming to us asking for a little bit of support, but really driving their own agenda. This is an example of one of the youth clubs having their own awareness campaign, where they advertised for it, they created this poster all by themselves, now, this is in a rural town in, in northwest Namibia, and it attracted basically the whole village. Um, I, I still don't understand this um, cross-dressing pageant activity that they seem to love, but it brings people in the door. So, you know, whatever it takes, um, whatever it takes. And of course, the music, which I'll mention in, uh, in a bit here, and we've got some really exciting new music videos that I'm going to play for you guys in a few minutes, but music forms a really key element of our approach of, of translating those messages to as well. Um, the guys like to do cleanup campaigns, again using a rhino theme, associating positive things. Anything positive that we can do and associate it with a rhino is, is, re is really good. Getting away from all this bad, bad, bad poaching, everything negative with rhino, let's talk about positive. Let's see if we can connect those two things. Sports. Sports are a great way to send a message, a positive message, message across to the community. You get these sports events that literally attract the entire communities that come to these things. And we've been able to sponsor now a number of these rhino-themed football tournaments, netball tournaments. We take photographs, put them on a fancy little rhino friend branded image, and before long they're everybody's Facebook profile picture. Um, you know, it's great. And just these little awards, again, with the Rhino logo, just gets everybody so positive about rhinos. But again, back to the music, this has been one of our really exciting ways of engaging and messaging with the youth, is working with a number of very well-known local musicians. Um, this lady is named Adora, and she's becoming really, really popular in Namibia, especially with the youth. And they put together this amazing Rhino song. And even a more amazing video that I'm going to play you now. And when you watch this video, I'm sure the music is not for everyone, possibly, but just imagine this whole thing was choreographed by the youth club here who are dancing in the background. They thought this whole thing up. All we did, we had a little drone here that the Minnesota Zoo donated and a couple other cameras that filmed this, this video. So I hope you guys enjoy our Rhino video here. Pretend you're a youth. Motherland, mother. 
talent, what they respect. That nigga if you go and delay she for run up what you make it news on a daily basis. Baby, somebody they move the fuck up. Always felt like I needed to be the change. We owe it to ourselves. The world is watching moon in your doubt, dollar. And the put you wear, then it's been like well fire. But that nature is losing. But that nature is buying. Can't stop. Can't stop. That's World's End, by the way. Did you guys like that? Yeah. Pretty good, right? Eh? A bunch of teenagers putting that whole thing together. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, really, really impressive. And the cool thing, too, is that because everybody used WhatsApp in Namibia, and it's really easy to, to, to circulate this stuff around once it gets put up on, on YouTube. So I, oftentimes I hear the song playing while I'm walking through town. You know, people really, really get into, get into this music stuff. So uh, just moving on to some other examples of what the youth clubs are doing now. They are also often doing these, these protests and marches in town. We've had some cases where they've come when, they've, when there's been a court case. One of our biggest problems also is even though poachers get arrested, they often don't get convicted. 
And what's even worse is they often get let out on a really, really ridiculous bail of like a hundred or two hundred dollars, and then they disappear to no surprise. So one of the things that the youth clubs will do is they will protest before the court case, and then they will ask the magistrate not to uh, award bail to the poachers. And when they've done this, no bail has been awarded. I've had two cases now, and the poachers have still been in jail, which is which is really really pretty amazing. One of our other activities, some of you might, might recognize these, our uh, Rhino Hero Jacket program. So this is part of those non-monetary awards, trying to get, not only get the guys excited, um, and of course they love the fact that these come from America also, um, but they get these when they pass five years of service. They get to put all their training badges on, they get little stars for every 100 Rhino sightings that they do, and they get them awarded every year on World Rhino Day in front of their whole community. And here is the, the Deputy Minister of the Environment, actually, who was attending our, our football tournament on World Rhino Day, and they awarded these jackets to some in front of the whole community. So they were pretty excited um, about their hero jackets. This is another way, again, of, of elevating their status um, in, in the communities. And we also have these award boards now. Again, same kind of approach, trying to give them these sort of intangible or in, intrinsic values uh, for, for their work. Things like photo of the month. So, so every single month, I have to go through about 10,000 rhino photos. <laughs> yeah, um, classes are coming. Um, we put them, we, we, we sort through, we try and pick one really good photograph from every single team. We put them up here on the board at our, at our base camp. The guys come in, they actually, it's, it's all peer review, so they have to vote for the best ones. And then the best, the winners get put on this photo of the month um, board, and we have annual awards. And then we also have patrol awards um, that look at all sorts of different things. How many, who, who had the most kilometers walked, um, you know, who was working in the more difficult area, who saw the most rhinos, all these little things um, that we, we know are making a big difference in these guys' morale. The other big um, intervention that we've been doing is something that we call our rhino pledge, pledge bracelets. Um, and what these are, very simple, they are leather bracelets that are made by a local Namibian company, um, very, very well known, very popular, and they have a rhino friend mark on there. And we have these ceremonies that are led by very, um, very well respected, um, well known leaders from the area, sometimes they're chiefs, sometimes they're government staff, um, and each person has to come up and pledge their support for rhinos and then they get one of these, these, um, these bracelets to remind them of it. And I've got a short little video here I want to show you, which is really cool, with the, with the governor of the region actually leading our very first um, ceremony um, last year at, at just after World Rhino Day. So this is Governor Njala. We must carry this one as a remembrance of the vow that we have made here, and we must then educate our colleagues, or let me say, our residents in the areas where we are living, to understand the value and the contribution that the rhino do in our immediate area. I thank you. of about 50 different chiefs and headmen from the whole area. So this was a really powerful... You see, uh, when you go back home, you tell them, the, your wife that today you have met, you have met another wife, <laughs> <laughs> you say the wife, that is not the right one. And we must be always protecting our rhinos from the corruptors, so, so what we're doing now is we're taking these, we're, we're working with these chiefs that have done pledges where now they go back to their villages with their constituents and they lead their own pledging ceremonies. So we're continually um, getting bracelets. I think we've done about five or six hundred now and we're looking to be doing a lot more in, in the futures, in the future. Lastly, just a few other issues. Not everything is really happy all the time. Unfortunately, we lost one of our rangers um, a few years ago. 
Um, he just passed away due to an illness, but we were able to really provide, I think, a, a beautiful memorial for him um, with a special, a special rhino um, 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 tombstone, which now is becoming, it's going to become sort of now a, a standard for all of our rangers that pass away. Um, we're going to be honoring them like this again, of course, if the family um, accepts. Um, but that was a, a real heartfelt sort of moment with, with the families. Um, we had our first female ranger join our program um, last year, which was really exciting. Um, and we also have another one that's come on very recently. So we're hoping this is another good trend, getting more women involved. Um, and then we have another music group. Um, this is a, they're, they're, it's a traditional group from the Himba people, which is a very traditional ethnic group up in the far northwest. They're very, very popular. They get sent out. Uh, to represent Namibia at a number of international events, the, the World Cup, um, uh, Olympics, and they're going, they got so excited about this rhino singing too, they're going to be performing some, some songs, they're putting together some songs, and we're going to also be doing some films with them, um, hopefully uh, next year. So, not everything is always perfect, I know I make things sound like everything is pie in the sky and we're in heaven, we have plenty of problems, um, we're always trying to work on better sustainable financing mechanisms. We're trying to get the communities weaned off of our support as much as we can. It's a long-term process. That's one of the, the, the real challenges with all this community work is it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. Those meetings under the tree happen again and again and again and again. But it's all important. Um, one of the most important things um, and one of the biggest challenges is when the community leadership changes over and we've got to continually try and make sure that everybody's up to speed, everybody's bought into this, to this project. Um, we need to manage workable relationships with tourism partners, easier said than done, business with community, oftentimes the operators try and take advantage of, of, of their intelligence and their power, um, so we act as sort of a broker to try and help this, but it's often a bit of a fight. Um, we are experiencing a little bit of potential resentment from some farmers, again, uh, ones that we haven't engaged with or ones that p potentially have felt like some of the patrolling is impacting them, so we have to manage that. Um, and then we always have issues with, with morale. You know, even though we provide all these things, guys run out of boots, guys run out of t-shirts, and it's hard to keep up the demand for a lot of this stuff. So always things that we're working on. But the take-home lessons, um, that we really try and uh, promote, especially to other organizations that, that we communicate with. There's a lot of other rhino programs in Africa, and one of the real important things about our work, too, is to try and share what we've learned as, as broadly as possible, and try and work together with other organizations that are trying to establish similar things across Africa. And a few things we've learned that have been absolutely critical. You need to take an interdisciplinary and evidence-based approach, and what that means is, like I said at the very beginning with my story, we cannot just focus on what rhinos need. We have to look at many, many other things. And we use things like social psychology, economics, policy science, totally different disciplines, but that all link in to a, a, a bigger win and work together to synergize the whole program together. One of the most critical ones is local champions. You have to have local people that are leading this initiative. And one of the biggest successes for me, personally and professionally, is that I feel like now, after six years, I can in many ways step out of many, many aspects of this program and will still carry on. It will still go ahead. And that's because we've identified some really great local champions that are really, really pushing this thing forward. One of the other things um, is that we, you really need to reduce barriers. There's so many things that we just think people are doing with rangers. We think they should have boots, but so many don't. So many don't even have socks. So many are expected to go out and patrol in these areas that are far away, but they don't even have transport. We expect them to walk. It's just, you, you gotta give them the things that they need to do their work. Um, but again, also easier said than done. And I think the last thing is creating this unique identity. Not housing it under one organization, one institution, but having something neutral that everybody can sort of rally around. These are some of the things that we've taken away from our six years and we're trying to share with um, as much as possible. And I just want to end with one last quick video, another music video. And this one, I'm hoping that 
you each will be singing this right now, if not right now, hopefully tomorrow. It's very catchy, so beware. And don't be angry with me if you are singing it tomorrow uh, in, the, in the shower. So this was produced by a school group that we work with, young kids um, that really wanted to provide something extra special um, for the Rangers and thank them for doing their work. She was a second grade teacher for a number of years, and that rhino puppet in there, she, she gave to me a number of years ago. So <laughs> he's become quite famous now. So I just, uh, I just wanted to end quickly with um, one little message, and that I know oftentimes, like I've mentioned before, the headlines, the media is filled with doom and gloom, rhinos are in trouble, but hopefully, hopefully now, you'll be able to say, uh, well, the Minnesota Zoo and their partners in Namibia are actually making some good progress, and we can be very, very proud of that, I think. Thank you very much. So I can take some questions, I believe. Any questions? Yeah. Soda is no longer with us. He, he lost his life um, a handful of about a year and a half ago now. <coughs> We're working on another one, don't worry. <coughs> 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 
Northwest Namibia, even though there, there's not a lot of, uh, of, um, of abundance of animals, there's actually quite a few, um, quite a diversity of animals. So we have, we have elephants, we've got pretty much all the carnivores, um, lions, leopards, cheetahs, hyenas, giraffe, um, lots of different antelopes, um, zebras, actually a unique zebra species also, Hartman zebra, that only exists sort of in the northwest or the western part of Namibia and just, just a little bit down into South Africa. Um, and also a lot of bird, a lot of bird diversity as well. Sorry, the question was, um, what other animals do you have in your area? I'm supposed to repeat the question. So. Yeah? No, nope. all local knowledge. They track them by their footprints. Okay. So when you mentioned earlier that they had GPS, what was that? That's for tracking them, actually. The, 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 the range. Yes, yes. So the, the question was, do the, do the rhinos, do they track them with GPS trackers? So my response was no. And the, the GPS trackers that the rangers are using is for them to record the location of the rhino when they find it, and then to also record where they're walking. And we use that as a measure of, of effort so that we know how much space they're covering to see which areas are covered so that at the end of the month we can look on the map and we can see where the gaps are, where are we missing, um, and we can look at where the rhinos are moving. Is this rhino moving out of the area? Is he staying in his area? We can map home ranges. So we can we can use that information for for a lot of different things. Yep. The reason why I was asking was because the GPS information, you know, poachers could get hold of it, you know, and then oh, you found one. Thanks for telling me. So we're here. Yeah. Yeah. So the the the, the, que the statement again was about about the concern with poachers, and that's a really really good question, a really good statement, and. What we, what we often um, do, especially with tourists, is we ask them, a lot of people have GPS trackers on their phones, on their, um, their cameras now. So we ask people to turn those off, because often, often information gets out completely unintentionally uh, when people post things on the internet, um, and people can, in theory, you know, hack into that in, in information. Um, and the same with us. So we have the databases that we use are usually double password protected. Um, they're only on a, a small number of, of computers. Actually, they're not even on computers. They're on um, hard drives that are very, very safely kept. Um, so we're very, very careful about all that information. But um, yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. With the success of your program, I wonder if there are other uh, conservancy organizations that are, that are following the same kind of uh, protocol? Yep, so the, so the question is, uh, are there other people using this sort of methodology or this kind of an approach. And there are a few. So up in Kenya and Tanzania, they have a very similar conservancy model where local people are able to manage and benefit from, from wildlife on their lands. And I, I didn't talk about that sort of broader detail too much, um, but it is a very unique element. And it's really critical that that institution has legal rights because again, in, in Africa and in most places, the, the wildlife is owned by governments, and um, you know, local people or you know, civil society cannot legally benefit from you know, the use of, of that wildlife, and rarely are they involved in management. So that is a fundamentally in, you know, critical element of, of that approach. So Kenya and Tanzania has sort of adopted that model. Um, there hasn't been yet a lot of uptake of the community-based ranger efforts. And a lot of that, I think, is because a lot of the, the anti-poaching work that is carried out around Africa is actually led by, by militaries. Um, and it's not really conducive yet with integrating community elements. It's sort of done on the side. But, but we've seen a number of, a number of um, initiatives pop up, um, and more and more frequently now, I think people are accepting that a, a community element is, is critical. Um, if we're going to, to stop poaching, both you know, in, in many other places. But we are communicating as much as we can, sharing what we, what we can, and of course very open to um, assisting in any way. Uh, we've been invited to, to come to Botswana um, and do some work with, with the, the Botswanan um, uh, folks doing tourism also, uh, and then also sharing ideas with the South Africans also. When you talk about a, how to approach
approach and go after the poachers, how are you going further up the chain? And when I look at the youth, you know, with their positive impact, is there a way to tap into that as well to be able to go further up um, and tackle that? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and the question was, how do we tackle um, the people higher up in the poaching chain? And, and I think oftentimes the, the, the real question is, who is the poacher, right? You know, is it the, the guy that gets caught in the field who pulls the trigger? Or is it the person who told that person to go in there and poach? Or is it the other person who asked that other person <laughs> to go find somebody? There's usually four or five different levels in, in, in the poaching chain, as, as we call it, all the way... You know, the vast majority of, of, of especially rhino horns are going to Asia, so there's Asian connections with businessmen who often connect to local businessmen in Namibia who then connect with people on, on, on the ground. Um, so it is very complicated. We don't necessarily get too involved in the higher up levels. Um, that's usually with, with law enforcement specialists, and we have no law enforcement mandate. We don't do law enforcement. Uh, but we do work with law enforcement. We provide in, in information whenever we, whenever we can, whenever we get it. Um, and the one thing that I, that I will share that I, I actually was meaning to and I, 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 I forgot, so thank you for reminding me. The other really exciting result that has come about over the last year and a half, it could be coincidence um, because it, it does align well with our Pride campaign. We've only lost one rhino since about April, about this time two years ago, 2017. But in that span, we've had 18 separate cases, completely independent cases, where information provided by local people to the police have helped them stop groups of poachers going and poach. So they've, they've explained exactly what they heard, what the scoop was, the police were ready and waiting for them and remove them from the area. We don't know who reported the information. That's obviously very sensitive information, but it could have been youth, it could have been farmers, um, you know, but those are the people that are going to be witnessing things, that are gonna be hearing and seeing that. You know, these people are the eyes and the ears on the ground, and if they have your support, if you have their support, um, you know, there's a lot that you can do. Very good ecological question. <laughs> you know, rhinos, uh, I'll be honest, they do not play massive ecosystem function roles like, like other species do, but as a mega herbivore, um, they do a lot of eating, they do a lot of browsing, and they eat a lot of different plant species. Um, so, you know, what they do is they eat, and all that stuff has to come out. They fertilize. <laughs> So they do, they do spread a lot of seeds for a lot of plants in a lot of different places. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that is really the main ecological function that, that, that they do provide, which is really critical. Um, but more than that, and if I can expand on your question just a little bit, um, and one of the reasons why I became so attracted to rhinos is that they, they attract so much support you know, from, from people. In Namibia, they have a national rhino coordinator. They have a national rhino committee that meets. They have technical committees that meet just for rhino. At the local <coughs> level, the local people are willing to trade off. A lot of the people that live in the area are farmers. Their, their livestock, their cattle, their goats are critical to them. They're like, it's like their bank account. And they're willing to trade off farmland, good farmland, so that they can have rhino in that area because they know rhinos bring tourism. And they know that rhinos do not like people, which is good. Um, so if they want their rhinos to stay there, because these rhinos are not fenced in, they have to give them space. They have to give them that, uh, that low level of disturbance. So, so it, that doesn't take place for a lot of other wildlife species. And what ends up happening is, because of that, a lot of other species benefit from the protection that rhinos end up providing. It's sort of this idea of an umbrella and a flagship. 
So because of that, they have a, 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 a sort of indirect role in also looking after a lot of other species besides pooping a lot. <laughs> yeah, way up there. So, quick question. Like, besides just throwing money at it and donating, is there other thing which I think is really important to put that money in financial, um, is there other things that we can do outside of even the financial side of it? Because it's easy just to donate and, it, and then you move on and then you, you know, you come to another event like this. Yeah. Is there something else that we could be doing that is important? What else, what, what else can we do besides giving money to support rhinos? That's your question, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great I question. Have a I have a second one also. Second one. Which, how long does it take that calf to be that big? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do the other one first. Okay. It's, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and you hit it on the head. I mean, money, looking after rhinos is not cheap. Um, and, and money is absolutely critical. Without funding, none of this could really be possible. Um, but what we're trying to do um, is create more sustainable financing through the tourism. So one thing you can do, which is good for you and good for the rhinos, is you can come to Namibia on safari <laughs> and do a rhino tracking activity. Um, I'm, I'm not lying, it's, it's really, really fantastic because usually about 25 or 30 percent of all the money that tourist pay goes right back to the rhino program and the people get a great experience out of it. So it's sort of a win-win. Right. Um, and the other obvious thing is to, to, to share the story. You never know who's listening. The, the more people that hear about these sort of positive stories, um, you're going to get more support. And, and people will, um, again, often donate, which is, which is the critical need. Um, but they also share the story. and You never know who is going to come across that story, especially with the internet these days. You know, you might indirectly um, create, a, create an open door where, you know, a corporation, for example, says, wow, this would be really cool to sponsor. Um, so just through sharing the story, you can have a lot of, a lot of impact. And the one very small thing that, again, might sound a little bit hokey, but which, you know, I've seen have a big impact is just sending a letter to the rangers. They love it. You write a little letter to them, get your kids to write it, color it in. Um, we've got all the rangers' names. You can personalize it if you want to. I take them back with me and, and personally hand them to the rangers. They, they really love it. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I haven't seen it myself, but some have said they actually put them up on their walls at home. And you know, Little things like that can, can make a really big difference. Um, and I'm sure there's a few other ones too, but the second question, how long does it take for that little guy to get that big? Yeah. Usually about four or five years they become sort of full grown um, in size and then sort of reproductive wise, usually about seven, seven to ten years okay. in, in our area. The females will start breeding at about the age of seven, but this guy's about two months old. Yeah. You can just see his front horn there sticking up if right. you look closely. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. You said you haven't lost any rhinos in about 20 months, but is the birth rate what you'd expect it to be or would you like it to be? Yeah, we've had great, great birth rates over the past year and a half, which we're very excited. This, I think, I've actually kind of lost track a little bit. I think this is the 18th calf that we've had born in the past year and a half, which is really exciting. And it's really important also when you consider that the previous two years, we had no babies born for 22 months, almost two years. We were in the middle of a really bad drought. And when that drought happens, they just don't breed. Um, it's a natural response because they probably know that if they do calve, the chances of them surviving is pretty small. So um, they hold that energy and when times are, are good, you see a lot, of, a, lo a lot of babies being born and we still have a lot of pregnant females. So I'll keep hopefully sending updates with a lot more, lot more nice pictures like this. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Lane from Books for Africa. He asked what else you can do. I wonder if you could talk about what the plans are for yeah. the books that just arrived uh, before you came here. 
Yeah, so we've, we've got this new uh, exciting project and often I don't, I don't talk about things that we're planning to do until we actually do them, just to not jinx myself. But we have this really exciting thing since you mentioned it. Um, Lane has been actually instrumental in organizing a great donation of books from Books for Africa, which is a, a Minnesota-based, am I correct? Largest shipper, shipper, is that a word? <laughs> Largest company that ships books to, to Africa. Um, and what we're going to do is, again, making this connection, hopefully, through a very creative reader program, Rhino Readers, where we'll be donating these books to local schools, kind of in the name of, of, of the Rhino. So we'll have, again, making that connection, and we're going to be setting up programs, hopefully, that, you know, will be, um, you know, creating, again, that connection where people see, oh, Rhinos are helping us educate and improve literacy of, of our children. And we all know the impact kids have on us as adults. I also have two kids now. And when the kids go home and talk about this to their parents, you know, they can have a tremendous impact. Tremendous impact. So I suspect people can also donate books to Books for Africa. And we're hoping this is the first of, of, of many shipments, right? <laughs> did, did you want to say some words? No. No? <laughs> you might know more than I do. So. Thanks, Lane. Right now, I just looked at these stats a few days or a few months ago. We just passed 4,000 last year. Huge, huge increase. So that, so that increase sort of parallels the, um, the increase in income. Um, but just to think, four or five years ago, we had, I think we were doing about maybe 400, three or 400, primarily from one or two camps. And just over the past four years now that we expanded from the two initial camps to now I think we have six enterprises, the number has just really, really increased a lot. And we've got, I think, three or four, three or four other enterprises that are kind of moving along negotiations. So these things take a long time to negotiate, as you can expect, with tour operators and communities. Trying, just trying to get people together under the tree is really challenging. Um, so it's a slow process, but we're hoping over the next three or four years we're going to have almost every single rhino in, in, in the area under some kind of community-led tourism activity, hopefully generating, again, more and more income, where we can even step, hopefully, completely back and say, this is yours. Yep. You had mentioned there was a need for boots, and I was thinking, here in Minnesota, we've got Red Wing. Has anyone ever tried to set up some kind of <laughs> we, Minnesota buys boots for... Yeah, we, yeah. There was a question about about boots and Red Wing, and um, we, we we had a luncheon this afternoon, and somebody mentioned the same thing. So our zoo director just had a meeting with uh, their leadership recently. I can't remember exactly when, but he said he's gonna he's gonna discuss it, and we might be able to we might be able to make a plan. He didn't make any promises, but it's a it's a great idea. I think that would be something that people at the zoo here would be you know, yeah. happy to support. Well, and we could sell them here in Minnesota with some proceeds maybe going back. We'll put a put a little rhino stamp on there. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Way up there. Over the back. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't get to go to luncheon because I had to lead a customer meeting, but I want to know if Nichols for Pickles to Save a Rhino came up because that is the campaign I still want to work on with Gedney and the uh, CHS field. So. It did not come up, but it sounds very interesting. <laughs> so the other thing is, people said, what else can we do? So two years ago, I came, 10 years ago, I went to the San Diego Zoo and did a behind the scenes tour and fell in love with all the animals, especially the rhinos, because they're hard on the outside and hard to love by some people, but I think they're incredible. So I donated enough for a pair of boots two years ago. And I said, that's not enough. So this last year, I talked to Brenda, and I set up a monthly donation. And American Express sends me a notification every month that it comes out, because it was like the card was used without being present. <laughs> and I sent a note to Brenda saying, it feels so good every month that my donation, and I earmarked it for rhinos, goes just to rhino conservation. But here's the other thing. I got a raise last week, or started this week, so you guys get a raise. 
Thank you very much. And I think again, this speaks to uh, the impact that you know a zoo can have in, in conservation outside of the zoo's boundary. And there's not a lot of organizations that can say that you know 100% of your gift can be earmarked for these conservation programs. Um, very few, in fact, a lot of them go. A lot of that money, often with the big organizations, will go to overheads, and very little will actually trickle off to the field. So I'm very thankful, and I can um, attest to this, this this great initiative with the Zoo Foundation. 100% will find its way straight back to Namibia, to the front lines. So thank you very much, and, and work on that pickle. Uh, <laughs> one more question, I think. Yep, right there. Yeah, I get, I get asked that a lot, and I, um, the question was about demand in Asia, um, trends. It's really hard to say. Um, we have seen last year a little bit of a dip in the poaching, which may suggest that the demand is going down a little bit, um, but it's, it's really, really difficult to say because it's a black market, and to try and understand the demand in a black market is A, really risky, and it's really, really difficult. Um, what, I, what I can say is that there's been some really good work being done in Asia. Um, I know of one organization called Wild Aid, which is trying to reduce the demand. And they've produced, um, they've got a great website if you want to go. They produce some reports that certainly suggest that the, um, the interest in buying rhino horns seems to be reducing a little bit. Now these are just surveys of what people say they might do, which again is always a little bit tricky and to get people to be honest with a really sensitive topic that they know is, is illegal <laughs> um, is also very problematic. Um, but you know it's, it's also a slow process and again I think even in Asia we have to work with, with, with young people. And I think I'll just end by saying that um, I also go to China every year, as, as Seth mentioned on, on a horse program, and I often meet with a lot of young Chinese um, in Beijing at the Forestry University. And I, I feel really hopeful. I mean, there are some amazing young Chinese that are coming up that absolutely can't believe what's happening. And they are bound and determined to do some things. And there's some really great people Chinese people. There's an organization that's coming to Africa now that's busy working with Chinese businesses that are moving into Africa to educate them and ensure that they know the penalties, they know what's at risk, and to try and, again, use people that, that understand the culture, that understand and speak the language to work with them in a positive way rather than everybody just pointing fingers telling them bad, bad, bad. So I feel very hopeful that there will be progress soon. And I think the one last thing I was told that I need to find, where's Jessica? I need to make a, or Jessica needs to make a very short of announcement because we have a very exciting event tomorrow night that will be a lot more entertaining than me talking. Um, and she's going to tell you all about it. Thank you. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much. I just want to tell you real quickly, my name is Jessica and I am a zookeeper here at the Minnesota Zoo. I work at the Close Encounters Department and I'm also the president of our AZAC chapter. AZAC is the American Association of Zookeepers and we are wanting to work hard to make sure that we support Jeff and all the work that he's doing in Namibia. It's extra special to me because I was able to get a grant through our conservation department this year and I actually traveled to Namibia so it's a little bit extra special for me this year. But I want to invite all of you guys to be a hero for rhinos and you can do that. It's a really easy thing. It's a really fun event that we're going to have. It happens tomorrow night and it is at Bolero in Lakeville and Jeff is going to be there. He's going to be kind of talking a little bit different uh, little shorter presentation tomorrow night. <laughs> and there's going to be lots of pizza. Who likes to eat pizza? Yeah? Anybody like to bowl? Yeah? Laser tag? Anybody like to win prizes? Yeah? <laughs> well, we're going to have a lot of really fun things. We've got some great giveaways. We'll be bowling. We'll be doing laser tag. Jeff will be hanging out. And we would love to invite everybody to come and be a hero for horns with us. And tonight, if you have a call to action and you want to do something to help us support Jeff, we do have some hats that we'll be selling right outside the doors tonight. So if you guys want to take home a Heroes for Horns hat, we would love for you to do that. That's a great way to support Jeff as well. So can we please give Jeff a huge round of applause? Thank you. Thank you.
everybody drives safe, and I hope to see you tomorrow night. Or in the media.